Good afternoon, everyone. I am Sulakshna hosting this webinar on behalf of Wadwani Foundation National Entrepreneurship Network. WFNEN is doing a phenomenal job in supporting startups, early stage and growth stage entrepreneurs and SMEs to grow their business. Entrepreneurs need mentors to scale their business to the next level and WFNEN provides such mentoring and learning platform for free to those who come and register at WFNEN.org. The mechanism is a very straightforward approach with goal-based, time-bound and structured mentoring. Enrich yourself connecting to 400 plus mentors from various fields of work and make a difference. As we begin, I'm so pleased to be with you and to have the chance to introduce our speaker, Hari Krishnan. Hari Krishnan leads investments at Extract Venture as the fund manager. He has over 15 years of experience, of which over six years as an entrepreneur, who founded a startup in the education space that raised angel investment before getting acquired by a listed education player. His current portfolio of investments include Foyer, Farm Easy, Whoopler, Rapido, Travel Khana, Absentia VR, Find Me a Shoe, and Hyperloop One. Prior to his track, Hari served as the Senior Vice President at Venture Intelligence, a leading research firm on VC, PA, and M&A deal activity in India. Hari began his career as a software engineer at Putney Computer Systems, currently called as iGate, and has an integrated Master's in Management from Bits Pilani. Oh, after the presentation, we have uh, a discussion session for around 20 minutes where Hari would answer your questions. So please send me relevant questions over chat, which would be answered at the end of the session. I would love to have your feedback on today's session. Your input and suggestion for future sessions are invaluable to me. So please leave your feedback on the poll and survey at the end of the session. Entrepreneurs and attendees who are here today have a great session and check back the webinar link on the website to hear the recorded version for self-learning and access the presentation anytime. You can also connect with the speaker who is also a mentor at WFNEN.org. Over to you, Hari. Thanks, Sulekshana, uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, hi, everybody. Very good afternoon. I hope uh, I'll try and make it live after a, uh, a lunch hour. So here we are uh, you know, to discuss what to expect in an investor due diligence. And how to be prepared for a smooth business. Right? Uh, uh, the ground of past, uh, uh, two rounds of investment startup phase and ventures having seen 10 deals that we have done uh, and subsequently eight of these uh, investments have taken multiple follow-on rounds post that. Uh, from these experiences uh, I'm trying to sort of share a very basic level of you know uh, requirement and preparation that a DD needs from an entrepreneur point of view. Uh, anytime you feel you need to ask questions, maybe you can put your question on the chat window and we could probably answer it towards the end. Uh, so I'm going to start with, uh, you know, uh, why is DD done and how it is done? And uh, post that also probably give you a, you know, heads up on how to prepare it, prepare for the DD. And cover the three different, uh, you know, DD aspects, the business DD, the financial due diligence and the legal due diligence. Uh, and within each of these, we will also, you know, uh, divide them into, you know, regulatory compliance versus business required uh, diligence within each of these domains. And also a few small tips and, and uh, you know, what could be the budgets involved, in, you know, in doing uh, the DD, etc. Right. So why do we do it due diligence right so as an investor we are going to invest uh, a large capital in an entrepreneur or a startup with whom we have very limited uh, you know interactions right so the the investment is a bet on the founder the founding team and the business the sector right so uh, 
So and while we discuss or we receive the pitch from the entrepreneur and have initial discussions, the entrepreneur presents the idea, business idea, we do very broad the because we are sort of in a business, talking to several players in the business. So we know if there is a pain point, if it's a consumer business, we ourselves are probably consumers and we would be able to you know relate to it by putting ourselves in the shoes of the consumer. Uh, probably in areas like market size when you claim, there again we would probably do a preliminary check from you know our industry sources or talking to some large players in the industry, traditional companies in the same industry. And probably also we might dig into a few research reports uh, which we sort of have confidence in. Uh, and uh, in terms of the claims that are made by the company, which are, let's say for example, you have 10 lakhs of revenue last month, right? And out of that you have uh, unit economics which is tending towards positive in the contribution margin 1 and contribution margin 2 is so and so and so on and so forth, right? So when you give us numbers like that, we believe and trust those claims at the first instance and make our in principle decisions, right? When we have our internal discussions within our IC, etc., etc., we take these numbers at face value and go ahead with an in principle decision for or against investing, right? So let us assume we are deciding for investing. So whatever claims you made, we have not verified it when we decide and then we come back to you giving a term sheet. After the term sheet is when, when we start actually doing the due diligence, we start verifying these, right? So it's important to keep in mind to make only correct claims. So when you upfront discuss, right? So you might, uh, you know, being an entrepreneur, you might always feel uh, you know, X number of downloads, X number of users, X number of, you know, X amount of session time, engagement time, etc. You might always tend to probably, you know, talk about it or, or talk it up a bit, right? But please refrain from doing so. It's good to sort of under claim and over deliver, right? If you always say, I have session active users of let's say 100,000 and monthly active users of let's say 20,000 and my average order value is let's say 800 and end of the diligence if we discover it's better right if it's a 19 minute session time but you rounded it off to 18 it's 110,000 users on a daily active basis but you claimed only 100,000 users your average order value is 857 and you claimed 800 great right we would love to you know move faster, we won't probably, you know, penny pinch on the last mile negotiation, post the diligence, if we get these kind of signals from the entrepreneur, right? So always sort of, you know, don't overclaim, don't overstate the facts because it, you know, have to face the reality. So it's, it's always good to be upfront on the actual claims. And uh, the diligence exercise is done just to you know 90 95% of the deals that we 98 99% will go through right unless otherwise there is something which is very big as a red flag right and this is also as i said you know we also get to know how the founder thinks and works right so it's a founder behaviors sampling exercise right we know whether you undercome it over delivered kind of an entrepreneur right so obviously also to make the company in good standing on the regulatory compliance uh, aspects right there are a bunch of you know regulatory things which we need to be you know in good standing on including taxes pf um, the statutory claims other statutory claims and you know uh, other legal regulation if you are supposed to get registered in a particular industry body or uh, uh, a particular department of the government uh, and all your MCA, ROC filings, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, statutory taxes like, you know, service tax, these days GST, and so on and so forth. 
So now we know why a DD happens. So how does it happen? So who are all involved and how does it happen, right? So there are three aspects in a DD. So one is a business DD and a financial DD and a legal DD, right? So in a business diligence, so this is a key diligence. So who are all involved in a business diligence? Uh, it could be people from the industry who, who are in a similar line of business, but probably in a traditional line of business, not probably using technology, maybe. They could be involved and uh, probably some domain experts could be involved. Probably some researchers in those areas could be involved. And on the financial diligence, you typically have a chartered accountant or a uh, you know auditor who's involved. Some of the larger deals would have uh, the big four being engaged for the financial DD. And obviously in a legal DD, you will have a lawyer who is involved, a corporate lawyer. And so who does engagement of these people? It's typically the investor who nominates you know, a person or an entity for doing each of these parts. It could be multiple people. For example, in a business diligence, there could be multiple people who could be involved. And business diligence could be a you know informal exercise as well. They would probably not do a structured diligence process, but they might just introduce you to a bunch of friends of the funds, friends of the investors, and probably ask you to have a conversation with them. And that probably would form the business diligence, apart from whatever diligence that the fund is doing directly on their own without you know having you involved in the process. And on the steps, typically there are you know these key handful of steps. Uh, obviously, uh, the first one is the business diligence, which is pre the term sheet. Uh, when the fund decides that this is a good investment, good sector to be in, good trend, good company, good founder to back, they do basic diligence. Let's say typically on the you know market size, is that large enough? Is it a billion dollar business? Uh, is it calculatable from a bottom up perspective to be a large business? Not just a Gartner report that says it's a multi-billion dollar business, but I know there are n number of customers, each one will pay so much on a periodic basis and then they will continue to pay month on month for so many years and I will get so much of a commission out of it as a revenue and that amounts to so many billion dollars, right? Number two, uh, there are other companies traditionally in this business and they are at so many, you know, so much of revenue. So that gives a, you know, equivalent of what a company uh, the size of the revenue of a company can be in this space, for example, and so on and so forth. So these are some basic business diligence that are done. And step two, investor gives a term sheet and post the term sheet is when the detailed diligence, especially on, you know, talking to your customers at length, IP diligence, patent diligence, legal diligence, financial diligence, etc., are done, right? Uh, so again, there is, you know, sometimes some people want to do the, as part of the business diligence, talk to your customers, right, before giving the term sheet. This is common practice. Uh, some funds will ask for this. Some entrepreneurs are comfortable doing this. Uh, you know, one dra drawback of exposing your customers before a term sheet to a, a investor is sometimes that, you know, the investor may not be very serious in his decision making you know, cycle. He is not yet made up his mind, but he, he might talk to the customer and sometimes, you know, he may not be very bullish. He might have some critical views that he would want to talk to customers and uh, customers will also get partially influenced by it. So you might, you know, uh, want to be a little careful about how do you handle that. So you might have to set expectation to the customer, uh, uh, you know, accordingly that he need not be influenced by the investor conversation, number one. Number two is that sometimes, you know, you might obviously keep talking to multiple investors. So you don't want a customer to get, you know, calls from, you know, five different investors in the next 30 days time frame, right? Or the next two, three months time frame. So the customer will, you know, not have a great opinion. I mean, these guys are talking to several investors, none of them is investing, or he may not even have the time or the bandwidth or the inclination to talk to you know prospective investors of your company, right? So to that extent, be a little careful in terms of you know opening up your customers for conversations with your investors as part of business diligence. It might be required that the investor needs to understand the space, the depth of the pain point, etc., 
uh, from customer conversations so sometimes you know you might you know be able to negotiate or push back a little saying that you know hey if you're serious give me a term sheet and then i will make some introductions right or you might be selective if you have 10 customers introduce only two customers whom you know very well probably who have been historically dealing with the company for a while and not open up everybody right or if it's a consumer business don't give let's say if you have 20000 consumers open up only you know let's say 100 consumers right maybe the criteria for opening up the database of 100 consumers can be set jointly by the investor and yourself let's say for example the week of uh, july 20th right it's a random one week of data that you give right so that the investor also doesn't feel you are giving a very selective biased sample to talk to etc right so but a very limited sample right it's only one week of data for example so so that uh, that is one critical aspect you uh, know in, in a business diligence that comes before a term sheet or after if it's after a term sheet you might be probably you know a uh, little more considerate give uh, a little more access to your consumers data or customers data again you might also have to check you know the data privacy issues how much of it can you open up etc so it's a little bit of a you know tricky uh, thing you have to do uh, dd but you will have to be a little cautious on uh, privacy of your consumers in terms of sharing data etc and yeah so after you do the you know three uh, major dd aspects at the end of it you know each dd uh, you know person would come back to you or come back to the fund with a list of issues found during the dd and then you'll sit with the investor or sit with the the dd person or entity and uh, find ways to you know solve those issues right most of them would be you know issues that could be solved while one or two could be you know bigger issues which may not be you know solvable in a requisite time frame or using the resources that you have so those are points for negotiation you could always go to the investor and say hey i know that you know i have not paid you know service tax for the last 3 months because i did not have cash flows but if only if the funding comes i'll be able to pay then the investor might be okay with it or the investor might say uh, you know what we want to come into a company only when it is clean so why don't you go pay up you know 3 lakhs or 10 lakhs of the dues i will give you an advance of this from the amount that i propose to fund and then you go clear the dues and then come back with a clean sheet and then i'll infuse the rest of the funds right so sometimes it might so happen in your negotiation or sometimes you might also tell the investor i will do it post closing so it's not a condition precedent to the investment but it is condition subsequent you can define you know what parts can be push to what stage right so that your investment or the fund infusion into the company is not held back because of some reasons which are probably only you know administrative uh, in nature right so yeah so in terms of preparation uh, you know uh, so what is the goal right so we are here to minimize the amount of time that it takes for the funding round to be closed as an entrepreneur you always want to finish the funding as of yesterday and go run your business right you want to focus on your business focus on growing focus on hiring focus on expanding with the new money that you've got so so how can you reduce the time of diligence right and uh, you know more often than not investors are willing to listen to you know proposals that you can make uh, narrow down the scope to really the things that they want to diligence upon uh, because a lot of uh, you know uh, startups don't have too many areas where the investors will have questions right so they would want only basic level of things to be diligenced on and couple of specific areas that they want to sort of get a little more conviction on right so if you can sort of scope that out very clearly by upfront discussing with them right and in the process also make clear abundant disclosures if you have a few areas where you have you know question marks that i am not probably fully compliant or fully you know satisfy uh, with a few things in my company go tell that upfront saying that hey i know i have not been able to do this 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 probably pay service tax or pf or you know uh, abc but that is just because i i am putting my cash flows into something else into sales probably 
and not into this but i will be able to do this once i get the funding or whatever reason i have not been able to do it tell it upfront and people are okay with that right so it's only when expectations are not met that people are you know unhappy and they could sort of form a bad judgment but if you tell them upfront and they find that to be true for some genuine reasons people are always okay right because most investors in india as you know you know have been entrepreneurs themselves so they know what it takes and they know what are ignorables right a few things are ignorables uh, in the indian context in terms of when you do business right uh, so yeah so the scope of diligence is negotiable and uh, you know uh, for example one uh, portfolio company that we invested out of the 10 investment we made there is one particular company which came to us and said you know for financial diligence i will give only 3 hours of my time and for legal diligence another 3 hours so it's only this send me whoever you want give me documents that i need to keep ready and within this 3 hours for dd of finance 3 hours of legal dd we are done right beyond that i will not allow you to do diligence he was able to negotiate that with us uh, we were also very eager to do the deal so probably we agreed as well so it also depends on you know where you are on the negotiating table who has the strength you know who's more desperate on the table etc right but even otherwise even if there is no competition for a deal most funds are happy to sort of you know give in if you give them very narrow down scope for the diligence right and the diligence also you know keep it in mind that it it will be commensurate with the kind of ticket size that the investor is bringing in or even the stage of investment right for a seed seed stage company you don't want an extensive financial diligence right because there's not too much of financial history in the company firstly right so you should always keep the uh, you know scope narrowed down in a seed stage or a, even in a pre series a stage right obviously series a and series b and so on are going to be more elaborate there's a lot of history a lot of you know data to check and verify a uh, lot of financial information legal information and also a lot of money at stake right so uh, what we have found work really well is when the founder has a checklist on his own or even ask a fund right but i would say even before asking the fund have a basic checklist on your own that is typically used by you know your lawyers or your financial you know due diligence partners uh, get them and do a dry run internally so give a financial dd checklist to your accountant give a legal uh, legal dd check checklist to either your in house lawyer or even to your admin guy or your hr guy or you yourself can you know uh, run through each of those checklist items and keep those documents ready and if there are a few things that you are not ready with get them ready before you know the actual dd begins with an investor right so this will help you cut short the time you know to a very significant extent believe me dd typically takes about 2 months in in an in investment context in india but the real you know time killing aspect is getting the documents ready in place right the actual dd is only a small duration event it's probably not more than a week time but getting the documents in place is the biggest time killer if you can get all the documents ready put them on a dropbox or a google drive share it with your investor and say here is all my documents share it with your dd partner and let him go through it and then come and do a you know inspection or a proper dd after that right so this saves a lot of time business diligence yeah so this is a key investment make or break decision right and uh, most often it is done in a b2b or a tech uh, deep tech sort of a you know uh, investment space so why does a investor do a bus dd obviously he wants to be sure that the industry needs and vouchers for the startup so as i said he would get a industry expert or a domain expert uh, introduced to you and want you to have a conversation with him and he will go and ask the industry expert you know to sign off on this deal right as well as that this is a great problem at this point in time to solve for the startup uh, for the industry right so what happens the investor introduces to a domain expert and then uh, one good news is that you know whatever be the outcome of the due diligence typically there is a plus to the industry person interaction right 
so they typically end up becoming you know partners or advisors or they sometimes even co-invest into the round right so we had uh, I, I can share with you two uh, you know instances so one portfolio company that we invested in uh, when we did a series a uh, you know fundraise after our seed investment so the new incoming investor prospective investor introduced him to a large uh, you know media entertainment company and uh, the ceo of that large media entertainment company it's a listed entity so he spent good time with this founder uh, on the problem statement and the solution that these guys were proposing he was so excited that he went and you know told the new investor that he wants to invest into the company right so he ended up becoming a co-investor in the company and because an industry player a large listed traditional industry player invested into the company it is becoming very easy for the startup to go and distribute their product into the market so they have become a channel partner right and because they have you know good number of you know distributors into the you know market the startup is able to sell their you know product very easily into the market so so this is a good, it's a good uh, you know uh, step in the diligence that might help you there is another uh, you know instance where one of our investing companies got introduced by the new prospective investor to uh, ex ceo of a traditional company in that domain and uh, the the new prospective investor did not invest you know for whatever reason they probably didn't chose to pass the deal but the guy who did the diligence after the diligence exercise i mean the guy who did the business diligence so he ended up signing as an advisor for this company so that's a good ending as well so uh, you know irrespective of the outcome business diligence is a great thing and good investors always introduce you to multiple people uh, as part of business diligence as part of help that they would do to a startup even if, if they are not investing but uh, proactively cheerfully take this up you know uh, be open to talk to as many people as many industry guys that the prospective investor is introducing you to be open in conversations you know there could be some secret sauce elements that you would want to keep it a little guarded but otherwise be open in your discussions and normally i found it you know as a win win for everybody right and uh, yeah so the second part of business diligence is that you know, investor would speak to your customers your partners as well right as i said to understand the pain point uh, deeply uh, and so on and so forth right so you might as this cuz want to be a little you know cautious on you know how many customers you uh, sort of open up uh, with the investor and when do you open this up so typically after the term sheet is is ideal but sometimes you know if the investor requests maybe you can open up a few customers uh, before the term sheet stage as well and uh, the financial diligence so why does a you know uh, investor does financial diligence so it's, it's mainly just to verify revenues are you overstating revenues so that's the 90% of the reason why someone would want to do a financial diligence right so so keep all the invoices you know uh, proper make all your income come to your bank account right do not have any cash transactions in your revenues uh so i think yeah so and report right revenues right historic revenues that you claim because those will be verified and any deviation from there will be a big red flag right so be very cautious on what you claim before the diligence during your pitching in time right and obviously the other reason is that you know there are not expenses that are being you know uh, siphoned off or promoter uh, expenses out some of his large personal expenses uh, as part of the company etc obviously these are you know red flags but these are not done uh, in uh, 99% of the companies but this is what is being checked right and uh, what are some of the checklist items um, typically the financial statements which is basically the balance sheet profit and loss and the cash flow statement uh, and preferably audited financials if you have more than one year of history and uh, up to the financial year end march 31st ending or unaudited financial statements till the last quarter right so and typically both right so income statement which is profit and loss statement balance sheet and cash flow statement that's the first one second 
uh, the entire accounts. So, which is basically people will want access to your accounting software, be it Tally, QuickBooks, whatever. Keep it up to date, and you might want to give a copy to them during the diligence process, and all supporting documents. So, if you uh, have made entries into your accounting software, be it revenues or expenses, you should have supporting documents for every entry made, right? Unless it's a very small petty expense, any revenues. It has to be bank, backed by invoices. It has to be backed by VAT or service tax or GST. Now, uh, those filings made. And any expense uh, has to be, again, uh, with a vendor invoice. And all of these have to be bank transactions, not cash transactions, right? And uh, yeah, any loan agreement. If the company has taken any loan, need to have a proper agreement and the loan should have come into the company typically through a bank statement and not typically you know taken by the founder and then the founder infuses money and then you have the loan shown as coming from a third party right so those are you know not uh, preferred mechanisms again to take loans there are other you know uh, checks and balances as per the company's law you will have to you know ask your auditor as to you know what is the right method of infusing loan into the company? Is it via directors? Is it via shareholders? Can a founder infuse money into the company, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera, right? And uh, also the cap table. So, so cap table is basically the list of shareholders of your company as on date, and people who have come through multiple ways into the company. It could be founders, it could be advisors who got in sweat equity, it could be. ESOP, it could be share transfers that you have sold some shares or bought some shares within the promoters uh, among yourselves, and maybe that there could have been a small, you know, friends and family round or a an angel round or a previous investor fund infusion. So all of this has to be captured on a timeline basis. So meaning you should have for every activity there has to be a cap table. So if there was one fund infusion, have one cap table. If there was an ESOP, have a cap table post that. There was share purchase, share transfer done among the existing shareholders have one cap table. So it has to be a cap table at every point in time in the previous uh, you know, incidences of any change in cap table and proof of each of them. So have uh, ESOP certificates or the share certificates, everything documented, clean, have it ready. Legal diligence, again, uh, there are two types of legal diligence. So one is a business legal diligence. And one is a company legal diligence. So I'll come to the first part, which is the business legal diligence, right? So when an investor is signing up to invest in your company, uh, sometimes it might so happen that you know, you know, some of the sectors may not be fully regulatory, uh, you know, cleared sectors, right? Uh, so you know, in India, a lot of uh, you know sectors are governed by several rules and sometimes by the state government, sometimes by the central government. You know, there are multiple agencies involved. There could be you know, an industry body that could sort of you know, uh, uh, monitor the uh, regulatory aspect uh, in that industry and so on and so forth. So you will have to be compliant with all these aspects. Uh, and sometimes if you are not compliant, sometimes you know, it might be a gray area. Sometimes it might even be downright not legal at all, right? For example, a peer-to-peer -peer lending till a few months back, why even few months, till even last month, it was completely illegal, right, in India. Until RBI came with a, you know, resolution, maybe a draft resolution now, or a resolution itself, uh, and it's now becoming more and more accepted regulatorily, right? So, uh, even our case, so we have invested in a couple of uh, investments, which are in the non-regulated or not fully compliant areas. Uh, but does it mean all investors will be ready to invest in such areas? Not really. Some investors are okay to take the regulatory risk. Some investors are not, right? So how do you sort of judge what sort of risk is okay, right? So my basic thumb rule is if it's a win-win for every stakeholder, right? So by every stakeholder, I mean the government, the public at large, the people who are current suppliers to that ecosystem, the consumers to the ecosystem, and obviously the founder and the investor, right? So if it's good for everybody, typically 
the regulation will follow. For example, we invested in an online pharma delivery company, Pharmacy e-commerce, right? So Pharmacy e-commerce is still not 100% fully free, clean shit regulatory. But by the time we invested two years back to, to now, the regulation has changed drastically. It's a 180 degree turn, right? At some point in time, people said it's illegal to deliver medicines to home, right? But now it's, it's come a long way. There is a you know pharma regulatory committee that has come up that has given regulations, draft regulations which have come out. Multiple you know iterations have been you know done on that. Now it's almost legal. There is a move towards becoming legal. Similarly, another company where we invested is in the by taxi space right so there was no law in india even today in many states there is no law again the regulation moved because these are industries where you know everybody benefits the congestion is you know going away traffic snarls time to transport you know it's more greener if you travel on a two-wheeler than a four-wheeler and so on and so forth right so as long as there are larger benefits typically regulation comes favorable over a period of time uh, you will also have to be lucky uh, if you get the timing wrong if the regulation comes favorable after five years if you don't survive for five years it's a it's a problem so that is a risk but you will have to weigh the risk and take the regulatory you know sort of risk as you go and uh, some of the vcs are downright not okay with taking any sort of regulatory risk even if the regulatory scene is improving they might just say because most of them have a uh, you know when they have raised money from their global uh, institutional investors or when they have their global you know ic meetings you know they have a very clear mandate saying that we will only invest in legally very clear uh, you know areas so so some vcs may not be able to invest in some of the you know gray area businesses and uh, but coming to the second type of the legal aspect which is the compliance risk or the corporate legal aspect there you will have to be fully compliant which is basically all the mandatory registrations like service tax you know uh, companies uh, shops and establishment act and roc filings mca filings income tax filings uh, pf etc if they are you know applicable in your case and so on and so forth so this is a necessary uh, you know compliance aspect and all vcs will want compliance in this regard right so what are the, some of the checklist items uh, so in the uh, deep tech companies you have patent or ip which will get checked uh, patent applications have them thoroughly you know filed and a lot of companies have questions here right so because i'm a small startup i don't have money to file patents patents are costly agree but in my opinion when someone comes and pitches me a deep tech idea and says that he has filed a global patent, not an India patent. India patent is not very you know, valuable as a perception among investors. If you have filed a global patent, you know, uh, may not be granted, that's fine, understandable, but you should have done at least the application, right? So that, in my opinion, is a, is a good indication that there is some real IP. If, the, if you have a good patent attorney who have gone through your you know ip and has done a prior art search properly he will search against the global patents that have been applied so far granted so far and if there is no clash he accepts your application and files an application and it is not rejected so far it's a very good sign it also has a meaningful impact on a the investment decision itself and b the valuation of the investment right so so any money that you spend on a patent application, a global patent application, while it is costly, typically we have worked with some of our portfolio companies, have worked with global you know, patent attorneys who typically charge seven, eight lakhs per you know, patent application, but it's, it's worth it. Uh, be open to this, have a budget for this. It's okay to spend on this. It, it has a good return in terms of you know, higher perception and higher uh, valuation while the investment goes through and the other uh, basic things that are required would be your founder agreements this is another thing that we don't see in the Indian context founders do not have a founders agreement in place 
please try and have a founders agreement a founder shareholder understanding between the founders between the co-founders right who holds how much who came in when and who will take care of what aspects of the business broadly it changes that's fine but just as a matter of understanding that you have verbally put it on paper and what happens when a founder exits that's a very key question not many of us answer it uh, i during my startup days did not answer this question there was a founder exits but we did not have it covered properly but it, it's it's tough to you know take those decisions because founders are friends typically right they've been working with you they've been studying with you probably you know them well so but keep this very clear when a founder exits how does the shareholding you know get treated do you do you buy it at face value do you buy it at half of the fair value vest some of it what is the duration of vesting be very clear on those right have those documented so founder agreements shareholder agreements keep the share certificates issued again lot of companies do not issue share certificates to the initial shareholders it, it becomes a verbal promise it's on an email etc please try and give share share certificates as soon as possible it builds credibility and trust with the company and also keeps you in good standing on the dd front if you have any loans keep lo loan agreements you know clear uh, mentioning clearly the duration of the loan whether it has the has an element of ability to convert it into equity uh, what is the interest rate and so on so forth uh, trademark applications any litigation history normally any litigation litigation will be seen as a red flag but if at all you have any litigation please disclose it up front it's one thing to know there is a litigation and decide whether it's an ignorable or not an ignorable by the investor it's another thing not to know of a litigation and get it discovered later right and you will never be able to fundraise in the market because investors know you know all investors know each other it's a very close community and people talk to each other on different companies as they're evaluating so always disclose up front it's okay customer contracts employee contracts vendor contracts reseller agreements all of this have them in place keep them ready put them on a draw box keep it ready right so these are the ones that will be checked during your legal diligence as well yeah so coming to the budgets uh, before that maybe i would probably you know also uh, go a little bit on uh, you know what happens when you find not compliant on some aspects right so it's always true practical that you can never be 100% compliant there could be you know a lot of misgivings on the financial compliance front on the tax front on filings to uh, authorities like roc etc on maintaining your books of accounts on maintaining your share registers board minutes of meeting so on and so forth right i mean most of you i we understand are first time entrepreneurs most of you would not have bandwidth in terms of time or even money to engage auditors or you know uh, accountants to keep uh, all aspects of compliance in you know both financial and legal things in place all the time we are fine with that we understand it right so but when issues come up discuss treat you know the priority items with high priority treat the low priority items with you know go to your investor negotiate timelines for it post investment right so most of these things can be taken care you tell them boss you infuse the money within 30 days we will get all of these things sorted right and if possible you know proactively keep these things ready right you may not do it all the time but at least when you are fundraising before 1 2 3 months of fundraise have these things in order try and spend some time because this eventually determines you know if your fundraising can close within 3 weeks or will it take 3 months and believe me in 90% of the fundraisers it takes longer time than what is really estimated and typically companies you know always come close to the you know running out of cash situation by the time the fund infusion is in right so any time that is saved on dd saves you a lot of stress saves you time you don't have to lose momentum you don't have to look for you know short term loans to bridge small you know gaps in your runway etc etc so any issue uh, treated proactively and any issue that comes be upfront you go and disclose it to the investor before 
he knows the bad news from the diligence company you talk to the investor even before the diligence begins or as the diligence begins when you realize something is missing go tell the investor or shoot an email to him hey we and we came to know that we came to realize that or we somehow missed this point just wanted to bring this up to you uh, you know right away from my side so people are happy if you bring it up it's okay and people know it's nobody can be 100% compliant it's okay as long as your you know key intention and key things are okay in place people are okay to live with smaller you know uh, issues and set expectations discuss upfront negotiate the timelines and the scope upfront be clear on goals i think those are the summary you know lessons in terms of diligence and yeah so what does it take you know how much would these lawyers cost how much would would the you know financial consultants cost who do the dd etc typically as a thumb rule in 90% of the cases what happens is the budgets are paid out of the investment proceeds but they are billed to the company so what i mean is if a company raises 3 crores investment and if a budget for dd for the lawyer is 3 lakhs and for the financial diligence is 2 lakhs so this amount the 5 lakh amount comes from this 3 crore that is invested by the investor so but it comes after the investment is made in the sense so 3 crore comes into the company and the company pays from the 3 crore after issuing a uh, stake to the investor for the entire 3 crore they give away you know this 5 lakhs expense for the dd from their side though the dd is done by the investor it is more often paid by the company but is it always the case no always the company can push back and say it's a negotiation thing right so you always come to an investor and say hey diligence is something that you are doing it from your side i don't have anything to do with the diligence you are doing it for your safety so you pay for it all fair right some investors are reasonable agree partially to it sometimes people say you know it's the industry standard we may not be able to agree sometimes people say you know you do 50% i do 50% or the companies the most practical thing that i found more common is companies in their term sheet put a cap to the you know expense they say subject to a cap of 1 lakh or 2 lakh for the diligence expenses right which is fair so sometimes if i engage a kpmg and they give me a bill of 10 lakhs i don't load all the 10 lakhs as an investor into the company right i would load only 2 lakhs into the company and the rest 8 lakhs i have engaged as an investor from my side so i will pay for it so so that's about uh, you know the budgets uh, maybe i could sort of you know uh, pause it here and uh, invite questions if you have any questions i'm happy to take questions and uh, one one more point that i wanted to sort of mention in the legal dd which i probably missed is uh when you also define your business in your memorandum of understanding and articles of association be very clear precise and define your business very well there uh one you know in your diligence it comes up you know sometimes people put everything under the sun we will do you know technology based solutions for uh, you know the global market i mean that is not a business definition right so you will have to put what exactly are you doing in which sector to whom as much as possible but keep it broad but keep it reasonably you know descriptive of the actual business that you are doing right uh, the second reason is apart from you know diligence bringing this up the second reason is you know you also when your ssa sha you put up you know things that you know define as uh, you know competing activity for example you will tell your investor that he cannot investor invest in a business which is competing in nature to your business right so for that reason you will have to define the uh, nature of your business very clearly only then your competition classes will hold good so that is another area you know to take care of whether your uh, definition of your business your in your articles of association or memorandum of understanding does it rightly represent your business right so that's another key uh, area that you will have to keep in mind and as a thumb rule so it's a legal dd and financial dd is typically 1% you know it's a very ballpark uh, you know thumb rule that i'm giving of the fund raised right both put together typically and at a seed or series a you can do both of it combined at 1 lakh that's the benchmark at series a you might do it at 3 lakhs each right so roughly 5 lakhs 
four five lakhs is a reasonable uh, number in my uh, opinion, right? So I hope uh, you know these uh, you know basic pointers help. And uh, you know if you need a checklist, write to me and and I I am available at hariyadastakventures.com and even any and uh, would have a lot of resources that you can sort of you know take help and uh, help you get prepared for the due diligence. Uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Uh, you have wonderfully explained uh, lots and lots of details which you would have otherwise, if without a hawk eye, we would not have just considered how to do it. And I am very sure that our attendees and participants are really going to benefit out of it. Uh, I am already seeing a string of questions coming from participants, so I will just uh, try to connect them over to you. Uh, participants request you to send me questions through chat or raise your hand so that I can connect. Yeah, uh, you can send me to chat uh, through chat what happens if I'm unable to connect you via the audio so I can at least read out the questions. So I, I'm just taking one question after another so please be patient and continue to send me the questions. Also I'm opening up a poll. This poll is in regard to the webinar what, what, what has been scheduled today in terms of the content, in terms of whatever the benefits that whatever whatever you liked out of the webinar please put it across to the uh, on the poll so i i am definitely uh, i'm definite uh, that it, it it has been a wonderful session and uh, just just let us start on with the question and answer now so i have question from uh, chetan uh, so i'm opening the line for chetan chetan you can speak out now please yeah hi hi uh, this is chetan here I just wanted to know if uh, one of the founders is uh, a defaulter in, uh, let's say, uh, ROC or um, if he is a bank defaulter, uh, will that hamper the due diligence and uh, eventually the funding? Okay, so uh, it again depends uh, on the severity of the default and the intent of the default, right? See, let's say, for example, uh, to give my own example, right? So when I was running my own startup, obviously, mm -hmm. you know, as a startup founder, I didn't have money and I took a car loan, a personal loan, credit card, everything, right? I was mm -hmm. the defaulter, right? But it, uh, but all of it was only to sustain my startup founder life, right? I mean, I didn't have money and I was mm -hmm. sort of, you know, maxing out on all my credit. So that is okay. That is understandable. If I have a bad civil score, nobody is going to worry about it. Mm -hmm. If I have not paid up my loans, nobody is going to worry about it. But Let's say, for example, if you are in the lending business, for example, mm -hmm. right, and the founder has in the past taken some large loans for a business purpose and has willfully defaulted, right? So that mm -hmm. is taken as a red flag, right? So people would not want, especially given the nature of business, the startup, mm -hmm. which is going to be in lending business, you want to keep your NPAs low, you, you want to have a very clean sort of, you know, credit history for your customers. And that okay. starts, you know, with discipline at the founder level, right? So, so that would probably be a red flag in that occasion, especially if it's a willful default. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So that's. Yeah. Uh, I hope that answers. Yes. Yes. Thanks. Thanks a lot. So, uh, next question I'm opening for uh, uh, Jyotishman. Jyotishman, you can please ask your question. Hello, Hari. Uh, this is Jyotishman. Yeah, uh, the query is regarding uh, the founder director. Can he infuse loan money in the company and how much in relation to the paid up and authorized capital? Uh, this would be unsecured loans. And does it require any agreement between the director and the company? Okay, so uh, see again. Uh, I am aware of you know uh, this being sort of you know changed a uh, couple of times in the recent past. So I would leave it uh, you know leave you or recommend you to sort of consult a lawyer on this. Uh, broadly, if you ask me, uh, only a director can lend to a company, right? That was the rule sometime back. But then later it changed to state that anybody can lend to a company, uh, but Again, it, it with a clause saying that only a corporate can lend, not an individual. And then finally, the last thing I remember is that anybody can lend, right? But you will have to check because the Companies Law Act changed in 2013, 
which came into effect mm. recently and they made some exceptions to it so i would uh, you know urge you to consult a lawyer for that uh, in my opinion it's it's okay to lend uh, and especially if it's small amounts the you know the penalties are not very big especially you know given that the startup will not have any other source to you know find money etc normally it should be okay but as an alternative if that is legally not possible the founder can always infuse money into the company as an equity and uh, if he wants to take it back after the fundraise etc he can sell out a little bit to cover that money back right so that's a work around uh, and the second question should there be a document or an agreement between the company and uh, uh, the founder definitely yes if it's a loan it has to be documented very clearly there has to be a reasonable interest rate on that as well right and okay. these are the legal aspects stepping back a little and looking from a investor point of view right typically as an investor when i look a company where the founder has given money to the company as a loan and wants to take it back i am not very happy right i would say boss if the lo- the founder is putting money to the company let him put it as equity right if it's your family money that's understandable if it's not let's say even your parental money but let's say you're getting it from your uncle or sister or you know some uh, one level out and that's a loan that's okay completely okay to get it into the company and get it repaid after an investor comes in but if it's founder's own money especially for founders who have worked in the industry for about 10 odd year the company and just wants to you know mitigate risk by calling it a loan and not putting it as equity money i would not be fully happy about it but is that a deal breaker may not be at all but uh, these are small signs okay thank you yeah the next question is from s hari uh hari i hari go ahead Uh, hari i am opening your line but you are self muted can you please check once yeah you can please ask your question hello hari hi yeah please ask your question hi ah uh, okay because of the some members or articles of association in the company uh, they are not seeing how to invest this money uh I did that can you repeat the question uh, okay uh, some members of the they are not uh, proceeding to the investors articles of association in the company that is the profit and loss statement okay uh, okay uh, the the investors are uh, what is the main buttons of the company why will they invest you and uh, how will hello go ahead Hari. Hello. So he got dropped. I think maybe you can go to the next question. Yeah, yeah. Hari, you can connect. Hello, Hari. Okay. So I am taking up the next question from uh, Vidhi Gupta. And in the meantime, if Hari comes back, uh, I can once again connect to him. So I am opening the line for Vidhi Gupta. Right. Yeah, please ask okay. your question. Hello. Hello. Hello Vidhi Hello Vidhi is also self muted Uh the question that Vidhi came from Vidhi was uh, when does the due diligence typically start we have been asked for a customer list right after the first conversation over a phone call with an investor would that be the ideal time to provide a list of customers Yeah so as I was also mentioning during the presentation so see some investors ask for such kind of information to even decide whether you know they want to pursue this deal further right because they have like you know 100 deals coming to them and they would obviously focus their energies only in deals which are getting good traction customer traction so i i think you should you know disclose some amount of information on your customers i would say probably representative information like for example you could say you know the largest telecom company in india has signed up as a customer or you know the third largest telecom company is in india is a customer 
without naming them for example right or let's say for example if you have 40 customers or 20 customers you give only three or four or seven names right i mean depending on what you want to inform etc and then uh, the rest of it you uh, sort of say that you know we will be happy to disclose it as we progress right uh, yeah, so I think, yeah, some names, especially they've not even met you, it's only one conversation, probably I would, you know, uh, prefer giving, a, you know, sort of a, without identity, giving some basic descriptive information. But see, end of the day, you will have to keep the investor interested in your company, right? You don't want to lose out his interest. So without hampering that process, but at the same time, without, see, end of the day, what do you lose by giving too much information, right? Not so much as long as you're not giving contact information of the customer if you're giving names maybe it should be okay or if you're giving in indicative list of customers i think that should be okay see and also it depends on the nature of the investor if it's a reputed investor you can always sort of you know trust to begin with that they will not misuse any information right if you don't know who the investor is if it's a non-descript investor or one-off investor then you might probably a little be, be a little more cautious. Uh, there is the next question coming from uh, S. Ranjan. Uh, yeah, okay. Ranjan, you can please ask your question. Ranjan, you, you can please ask your question. Okay, he has self-muted himself. So the question Ranjan asked was, how are the checklists that we need to look at? Who helps to build a business report and financial reports for startup founders? Okay, so typically, I mean, I mean, most most often it is the founder themselves who will have to, you know, get all this ready. Uh, you can, you know, if you're able to hire someone at least part-time, you should hire an accountant or an auditor, a CA, typically who makes your filings, etc. He would be able to help you with your financial checklist and financial reports and statements, etc. Keep it in order. And also partially engage a lawyer. Uh, again, you need not spend too much of uh, money onto this, but I would say even if you have someone engaged uh, for even, let's say, 10,000 rupees, I think you should be able to get a lawyer spend at least you know, two, three hours of their time and get the basics of your company in order, right? So I think, yeah, so the founder himself and with a little bit of help, at least part-time from both the accountant or an auditor and lawyer. Sometimes some CAs will be able to do most of the basic regulatory legal work as well. For example, keeping your MOA in place, share certificates in place, etc. Even an auditor would be able to do. You need not even engage a lawyer. For basic stuff, you can get your auditor. So one auditor, part-time, I think is, is he is also commonly available, not very costly. You can engage him. There is a question from Swapnil Agarkar. Swapnil, uh, can you please ask your question? Hello, Hari. Hello. Hi, Swapnil. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, yes, I can. Yeah, actually, yeah, yeah. You made that this DD very clear to me. Yeah, I was actually, <laughs> yeah. This this term was very uh, like a monster to me, but yeah, it was very clear <laughs> to me. Yeah, right. Like uh, my question is, uh, I was as a father and uh, son duo uh, company. We are startup in ed tech, and um, as my father is also in education, so we started this company. So you you said you mm -hmm. uh, th there should be an agreement between the co-founders. I mean, in this case, uh, since we are blood related, I mean, uh, is it that important? Uh, uh, yeah, between father and son, I don't think, uh, you know, it's required. Uh, yeah. You know, we know the Indian context pretty well. Uh, so, uh -huh. I, obviously, I don't think it's required between a father and son uh, kind of relationship. Okay. okay. Yeah, but it's okay. sort of, you know, friends as co-founders, maybe I would expect. Right, See, again, right. okay. this is a nice to have it's not a must have because we understand you know it's between the founders we don't get into what is the relationship between the founders but it's good only for the founder if a co-founder has to leave at some point in time it's good for the founder to know what will happen to the shares right 
but in okay. a father son relationship it does not matter you are okay. you are right yeah okay excellent thank you very much hari ji thank you yeah thank you uh i'm opening the line for ishan pande ishan may you uh, please ask your question ishan pande uh okay the question from ishan was should a startup also go for an investor due diligence on corporate governance and conflict of interest or would it be impolite to do so a very good question uh, so definitely it's a it, it's something that's to be done uh, you know there are you know you don't know who the investor is etc and even if they are you know reputed investors they they might be conflict of interest situations uh it's a little bit tricky uh because it's it's not customary or it's not a standard practice given the you know how the demand supply between startups and investors are uh in uh, today or any days context right uh it's difficult but always do a reference check right on an investor primarily from a portfolio founder of that investor so let's say if you come to me as stark investors you should probably talk to any of our portfolio founders so we have invested in 10 companies right so out of the 10 you would be able to relate to someone through some connection you should talk to them and find out how we are in general how do we relate to the founders you know uh, are we short sighted or are we sort of you know founder friendly what are the terms that we do post investments how do we behave do we value add those are the things that you should definitely talk to you know portfolio founders and get to know uh this specific act, aspect of you know conflict of interest is uh, not easy to find out uh but there are at least the portfolio let's say for example if you come to us with a business idea and if you want to know whether we have already invested in such a company earlier uh typically you will be able to find it from our portfolio page of our website if it's disclosed investment most of the dis- investments are disclosed by most funds sometimes if it's undisclosed investments if you ask the you know investor up front saying you know we want to know if you have any investment in this space uh he might tell you and then if it's competing he might even tell you but sometimes we have seen you know our peers in the industry not disclose their competitive or conflict of interest situations uh you know primarily to understand take information from startups as well but so yeah i mean that's a little bit of a you know uh, tricky situation but i mean end of the day you will have to trust that 99% of investors are good they will not sort of you know be in a conflict of interest situation and not disclose it uh, which i have also seen largely that is the case so yeah it's 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 good to be a little cautious do a little bit of ref check and maybe you could use uh, databases that have uh, investors portfolios and crunchbase would give you their investments you know maybe uh, databases like venture intelligence will give you some of the uh, you know past investments of investors and go to their linkedin and see you know if they are connected to your uh, competitor companies founders etc right so typically if i have invested even in a personal capacity to a competitor of yours i would be connected on my linkedin uh, to the founder of that company so yeah so those are some signs if you if you find some connection then you ask upfront this question you know i see that you are related to uh this founder on linkedin so do you have a investment relationship or is it just a you know customary relationship so yeah i hope this answers i have uh, i'm trying to open the line for s hari again uh hari you have self muted so maybe you can unmute yourself and ask a your question s hari so hari had asked a question what is the founder agreement okay so founder agreement so typically you know in most startups we have more than one founder so so whenever there are more than one founders you you have a between the founders you have an agreement so that's the founder agreement so for the co-founders right so if there are three co-founders in a startup let's say each starts with let's say first founder has 20% equity second guy has 30 third guy has 40 let's say right so between them they need to have an agreement to say 
you know, these are the terms of association and it's a very simple one pager also. What happens, let's say, in the unfortunate situation when someone has to exit, right? Uh, right. So will that exit, let's say founder 3 exits, will he sell his shares to the rest of the founders? If he sells, will he sell it at 10 rupees or will he sell at the market price? Will he sell everything or will he sell half of it or quarter of it, right? So those are the right. agreements that probably that can be, you know, those are the things that can be covered in the founder agreement. And it's always a very good practice to have a founder agreement because a lot of times we've seen the failure of a company happens because of co-founder issues or you know inability to fundraise or obviously the product market doesn't fit right so so there is a high chance that you know founder related conflicts might arise and it's always possible to prevent that by having an upfront conversation and having it captured in a founders agreement okay <clears throat> hello yes Okay, what is the main importance of the red flags? So a red flag is something that you, let's say if you have not done something correctly, right? If you have, let's say for example, if you have not filed, let's say taxes at all, you have not filed okay. the provident fund for all your employees for your last one year, for example, okay. or if you have not paid service tax for the last six months, right? So it's a red flag. Okay. It's a red flag in the sense it's, it's uh, the investor will say, why have you not done it? So you're not regular. So it's a illegal, you know, complaints issue. And I may not sort of, you know, come into the company. I will know there is some stress or strain or customer is not paying you enough or you're not paying it on behalf of employees after detecting it, detecting it from salaries or things like that, right? So, yeah, so I, I would not say small taxes unpaid or small, you know, irregularities as a red flag. But if they are major, if they are large, either in number or if it's a very critical thing, or if it indicates, you know, uh, integrity issue of a founder, those are red flags. Or if it's an accounting, you know, uh, loophole, those are red flags. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much for your valuable answers. Sure. Thanks. Chetan asks, do we need to sign an NDA before disclosing the customers to the investor? Again, uh, as I said, uh, it's part of the customer diligence sort of a, sorry, investor diligence sort of a thing. See, uh, it again depends if it's a very critical information, you might ask the investor to sign NDAs. Uh, but again, as a general industry practice, investors typically do not sign NDAs because they are in the business of investing and they talk to multiple companies in the same space before deciding which one to go ahead. And whatever you put, if I sign an NDA with company A and end up not investing in that company and invest in a company B, how much ever I, you know, not disclose the information that you have given me as a company A, it's always there, right? I mean, it's in the back of my mind and I might use that indirectly to decide something else on behalf of company B. So, which might be against the NDA that I've signed. It could be construed as against the NDA that I've signed. It's not very easy to establish that. So, typically investors resist signing NDAs unless otherwise it is a proprietary or very significant information. So, I'm not too sure for customer information but for something that's more key, let's say, for example, if you're disclosing algorithm that is used in your, you know, software, if it's a AI software, let's say, if you're doing some, you know, data collection through proprietary methods, if you're disclosing those kind of things, yeah, those kind of things or patent related information, details, architecture, etc. those kind of things, NDA, definitely, yes. Customers, I'm not ruling out. If it's a critical information, if you think it's critical and if you're disclosing Let's say even personally identifiable information, let's say mobile phone, email IDs, contract values, and all of your customers, then yes, it, it might be required in some cases. Some investors would be okay. And no harm asking the investors, right? So you, you can always ask the investors for an NDA. Some of them will politely decline citing the reason. Some of them will be okay to sign it. 
So Chetan also uh, asks, is there a standard checklist for documents needed for DD? Yes, there is. Uh, as I said, uh, it's a good practice to get a checklist and keep prepared uh, you know, before the actual DD begins. Uh, you might be able to find some of them online or you can write to me at hurry at astarkventures.com. I can send you the standard checklist. Any lawyer also will be able to help you. Maybe even NEN would, would be able to help you. I'm opening the line for Praveen Shinde. You have self-muted. Pravin Chinde had a question. So he had asked, my startup has started last year. Yeah, Pravin, Pravin, may you please ask the question? Hello. Yeah, Pravin. Yeah, my startup has started last year and uh, we are investing uh, much and right now we are not generating any revenue. So how I, how I uh, invite investors? Yeah, so I mean, again, it's a, you know, not all startups generate revenue in the initial stages. So it's uh, perfectly okay, depending on the space and depending on the business model that you're following. So you can talk to investors, even if you're not generating revenues. That's absolutely fine. Okay. Okay, thank you, sir. And investors typically don't invest uh, to get share of your revenues, right? They're looking for valuation upside when they sell your company. So sometimes it may so happen that you may not generate, generate revenues at all and still be able to generate value. So it's, it's not a complete no, but yeah, uh, any revenue is always a good indicator that your product is valued by your customer. So that way it helps, but you can still start talking to investors. Okay, okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Vidhi Gupta asks, does it matter if a founder is involved in businesses other than the startup he or she is working with? Yeah, uh, so this is a you know common you know thumb rule uh, evaluation that we do. We typically do not like founders who have multiple startups or who's not full time in a particular startup. We don't consider them serious enough, right? If someone believes in an idea really so strongly with so much of conviction, only then we would tend to part with our money. If the founder themselves are not fully you know, involved or fully signed up for that one particular idea, then it, it sort of is a signal that, you know, to us, I mean, the founder doesn't seem like 100% convinced on that idea and hence we will not probably be convinced. So we typically, you know, it's a filter. It's a first filter. We might rule out such startups even in the first meeting or first call. Uh, there's one question from Aditya Sengupta. Aditya asks, do all bills need to be preserved in original or are scanned copies acceptable? Yeah, yeah. so uh, scanned copies are acceptable uh, as a you know uh, good practice. You can probably preserve the ones that are large amounts. So anything probably let's say more than 50,000 rupees, you preserve it. Otherwise, you, you do not need to. And it's, uh, you know, have scanned copies, that is fine. I mean, I think the... Companies Act allows electronic copies of bills. Uh, they consider that as uh, you know legit uh, sort of copies, and they they would come and ask uh, as per the IT rules. They can come and ask you for any bill for the last seven years. So seven years of bills is what they require you to preserve as per the law. Uh, no more questions. I have received the from the participants. So I assume that uh, like uh, we can wind up the webinar now. Uh, so concluding this webinar on preparing for investor due diligence, it was a pleasure having the webinar session with Hare Krishnan. I truly appreciate the way you covered each and every topic in detail and also cleared our doubts on the same. And I would also like to express my appreciation to the participants on behalf of WFNEN for your dedicated participation on the webinar. I'm sure you had a great session and you can check back on the webinar link on the website to hear the recorded version for self-learning and access the presentation anytime. Maybe tomorrow you can possibly connect and figure it out. You can also connect with the speaker who is also a mentor on WFNEN.org and we would also be having another webinar session so shortly and would like to bring to you another enriching experience. Wish you success in your endeavor. Thank you all. Uh, thanks, Selectionar. Thanks, Inian, and thanks, all participants. 
all the best for your uh, startups bye bye